All right, we are recording. Thank you everyone for joining. My name is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester and coordinator, director of the Cornell Forest Connect program. We have our monthly webinar. And as I like to do, I bring in fabulous speakers because over the years I've given the few talks that I have and I don't want to rehash those, but we have two great speakers with us this evening, this, this noon, be back this evening for a repeat. We're joined by Dr. Joe Arifache from Yale University and Dr. Jeff Ward from the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station. I've known both of these gentlemen for a very long time. They've accomplished much and I will let them give a bit of a self-introduction as they present. Actually, let's do that now before we get into the presentation. So, Joe, why don't you give a little self-introduction and then Jeff. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, glad to glad to be here. So, um, I'm uh, director of forest and agricultural operations at the Forest School at the Yale School of the Environment, um, and uh, I teach all kinds of courses as well as a lecturer at the school, forest management courses, uh, operations, things along that ropes. And um, I also, I, I prior to this, I actually worked with Cornell Cooperative Extension in New York as the Northern New York Maple Specialist. So um, I've sort of been in this region for a while doing a number of different uh, projects and, and practice and research related to forests. So glad to be here today. Turn it over to Jeff. Hi, I'm Jeff Ward. I'm Chief Scientist of Forestry and Horticulture at the uh, Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. I've actually known Pete since 1985, since we uh, worked together out in Indiana, and I've been in Connecticut since 1987. Yes. So thank you both. And we will start with, uh, so today we're going to talk about carbon and forests and forest management. So we'll start with Joe. Joe, if you want to share your screen, and I'd suggest shutting off your video so we don't have any bandwidth issues. Sounds good. I can do that. All right. Thank you. It's all yours, Joe. I'm you. All right. Um, all right. So thanks. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about managing for forest carbon. Um, and there, there's a number of aspects to managing for forest carbon. But I just want to go back in time a little bit to, to multiple use forest management, which has been around for uh, over 100 years, really. Um, this is the idea of, you know, forests, especially in the U.S., which is probably our major audience here, uh, of, of having multiple uses come out of our forests, not just timber, right, but recreation and, and western lands, grazing, uh, mining in some examples, but also uh, this is advanced through time beyond just some of those extractive uses to things like uh, recreation, wildlife habitat, um, environmental quality. And if we think about managing forests and what we manage forests for, especially in this, this region around New York, we manage them for all kinds of things. Um, and carbon has really become an additional forest management objective. Carbon is, is the modern addition to why we should be managing our forests well and what we should be uh, keeping our for why we should be keeping our forests as forests at least at the very at the very minimum um, it can be combined with many uses right uh, the trouble with carbon is the science is incredibly complex and often we are seeing carbon these days being used to argue for or against other uses um, and and that can get really confusing. So what I'm going to do in this talk today is, is try to dive into some of that and, and thinking about like how carbon can be a component of our forests, of our forests as, as we manage them. Um, and, we, and we need carbon as an objective, but we need to be careful that it's also not the sole objective, just like any other use of our forests within a multi-use uh, dynamic. If they are the sole objective, they can be really detrimental across the landscape to other objectives. And so carbon, we want it to be a major objective, but not necessarily our sole objective because it could cause problems if, if that's what we do. So um, I, I joke about, about this, like if carbon were our sole objective of management for our forests, we should just cut down all of the trees, dump them in a lake, do it, you know, let them regrow, do it again, let them regrow, do it again. So that way we're constantly pulling carbon out of the atmosphere 
in trees, when those trees are big enough, we dump them in the lake to store the carbon perpetually. And then the trees regrow and we do it again. There's obviously a number of reasons why that is a terrible idea. And I'm not promoting that idea. What I'm, what I'm suggesting is that if we go to extremes as, as carbon is the only thing, we could end up in situations that are very detrimental to our environment in other ways. Um, and so one of the things we think about it, it, within our school here uh, is resiliency as it relates to carbon. So not that we have to maximize carbon everywhere, but over time and across our landscape, we try to maintain resiliency of our forests so they can stay forests and they can recover and grow because that's what they need to do. Right, and, and this bottom image is, is images of the hurricane of 1938, which was a major disturbance in our region that really was a landscape level uh, disturbance, which, which changed our forests quite a bit and, and changed the carbon dynamic from forests that were sequestering and storing carbon to forests that were releasing carbon in the atmosphere over a 24 hour period this happened. So uh, we have to think about that level of disturbance. So within forest management, um, considering forest carbon, in my mind, I, I break this down into three areas. Forest products, carbon storage, and carbon sequestration. So forest products being a way of storing carbon and uh, reducing fossil fuel use from other types of products. Carbon storage being carbon actually stored in the trees above ground, and then carbon sequestration being uh, trees' ability to take carbon out of the atmosphere. All of this all of these benefits we can we can achieve from forests as they relate to carbon only work if we keep forests as forests. Um, so with this first one, forest products, right? If not wood, then what? So if we are not utilizing the wood from our forests, what are we then going to utilize for construction, for the needs of society? We're gonna use concrete, steel, maybe plastics, right? And in this, this uh, figure on the right is just showing some of the uh, carbon requirements of using something like steel joists compared to um, lumber-based joists, wood joists. Incredible difference in, in carbon. So one of the major carbon benefits of our forests is that they give us wood, which can be used as an alternative to materials that are more intensive in terms of fossil fuel use. And I use that alternative term uh, cautiously. I'll get into that in, in a little bit here. Um, this is just, is just another uh, slide showing some of those different dynamics, energy use uh, by material, right? So timber, fossil fuel energy use or production in the bottom left uh, compared to concrete or steel or aluminum. Um, and then in the top, uh, this, this carbon impacts of wood paper was just using different substitution products. So for example, we're in the Northeast, the top line of this top table, hardwood lumber, their substitution product that they were using in their models was polyvinyl chloride, right? So like plastic, um, not a fossil fuel friendly material like hardwood lumber would be. So if we're thinking about our forests, one of the major carbon benefits are these, are these especially solid wood products. Now it gets a little bit more complex and, and, and difficult when we get into things like bioenergy, where we're using the wood product, but then we're immediately burning it. And then that carbon is being released back into the atmosphere. There isn't necessarily a long-term storage there, um, but are we not burning fossil fuels by doing that? Um, this, it gets complex. And one of the things about bioenergy especially is, um, is it's hotly debated and partly because in the United States, we produce quite a bit of bioenergy that then gets shipped to Europe as uh, a green energy um, wood pellets for, for electricity. And so there's, there's a lot of complexity there. I'll, I'll point out we're having a, at Yale here, we're having a Yale Forest Forum this semester, which is open to the public on this specific topic of bioenergy. So if you wanna hear people, from people who are experts in this, uh, there is an opportunity there. We can, I can share that later. But um, I'm not an expert in, in bioenergy by any means, but that's some of the dynamics around that, that conversation. Um, our, you know, one of the things we, we utilize here is firewood and firewood often gets looped into this conversation, but is a very different animal um, in terms of substitution, right? Firewood's almost a direct substitution 
for home heating oil in rural areas. So this is uh, the Yale Forest Forum, uh, what we're doing on bioenergy this fall. So if people wanna get into that, there's, there's an opportunity there. Um, also, I mentioned that word alternative before. I just wanna make the point, wood is not the alternative to steel, right? Wood has been around a long time. Here's my, my old barn when I used to live in Northern New York. That was probably built in the 1860s, 1870s. And um, originally I would have a wood roof and that wood's been around a long time, right? Steel has, is the alternative to wood. It, it, we need to make sure we're talking about that appropriately. We are using wood, uh, steel to replace wood. We are using a non-renewable, a non uh, a fossil fuel intensive product to replace what was most commonly used as, which is wood, which is a renewable and carbon friendly product. So um, let's you know, make sure we're on the, the right page with that. Now forests, another, another aspect of forests is this, uh, this concept of them being one of the nature-based climate solutions. So ways we can sequester and store atmospheric carbon. That's the idea with nature-based solutions that we can pull carbon out of the atmosphere with natural systems and store them in those natural systems. And forests are getting a lot of interest in this concept. Um, this is uh, a working paper from uh, World Resources Institute just looking at um, one of the center lines here, sustainable forest management. It is, um, it ranks very high in adaptation benefits, potentially high in uh, biodiversity and global greenhouse gas mitigation potential as compared to other types of nature-based solutions. Um, the bottom one there being large scale afforestation, meaning planting trees and creating forests where there weren't naturally forests that can have really negative biodiversity effects, even though it might have positive carbon effects, could have negative biodiversity effects. So one of the reasons sustainable forest management gets a lot of interest as a climate solution is there's a lot of other positive things that can come with that uh, positive forest management. So are these forest carbon offset programs just as an example to describe um, some of these concepts around sequestration and storage in forests and um, some of, these, some of these concepts I want to get into that we, we just really need to think about for thinking about how do we manage or use or not manage our forests for carbon. One is we have to think about permanence. So how much are these things we are doing reversible, right? And is the carbon in the forest permanent or is it not? Um, leakage. Right, so if we are, let's say, sequestering more carbon in a forest in one area, does that cause us to have a greater harvesting pressure on forests in another area, right? So what we think we're doing as a positive is actually just leaking out into, into another area. Um, if we preserve forest in one land, in one area, but then we are gra grabbing forest products from an area further away with a greater carbon uh, a fossil fuel carbon demand, where actually our leakage is actually, by preserving this land, we're actually causing greater atmospheric damage by pulling wood products from somewhere else or using more steel products, for example. And then the other concept is additionality. And with nature-based solutions, this is the idea that what we are doing is not something we would have done anyway. And, and let's dive into additionality a bit more. So. This is looking at time in years and carbon tons per acre. And the additionality here is the difference between, in this case, a carbon project baseline and then the project activity. So things you would do to increase the carbon stocks on the land compared to what you would, what the baseline says you would do. And then the additionality is actually what's in the middle. Um, and that's, that's the nature-based solution. So that's saying this is the carbon that we are pulling out of the atmosphere and storing that we otherwise wouldn't. But there's been some concerns around this over the last year. Um, these are some headlines from 2020 when uh, there was some heat being thrown around, around uh, carbon credit projects. And, and I think the base with some of this, you know, the, the, the concern here is that these carbon credits are meaningless, meaning companies and organizations are saying, we are carbon neutral. We are burning fossil fuels, but we are carbon neutral because that carbon is we're, being, we're paying to have additional carbon stored in forests. And there's 
an argument that those are meaningless. And, and I think the base of this question is, we are burning fossil fuels or allowing companies to burn fossil fuels, claim carbon neutrality, and then by storing carbon in forests, but that carbon in forest is not a fossilized carbon emission. Carbon in forest does not continually build up and build up and build up over time. Eventually it's lost to disturbance. And if, if carbon continually built up in forests, we would see organic material just building up on our forest floor over the last 10,000 years since glaciation. And that doesn't happen. Eventually our forests reach a carbon saturation point, meaning the amount of carbon stored then gets balanced with some type of disturbance loss, such as uh, decay or even fire. And so we need to think about that permanence and are these, is this forest carbon really an appropriate um, substitute for burning fossilized carbon? Not to say we shouldn't be using forests to pull carbon out of the atmosphere, but should the question is, should we be justifying burning fossil fuel carbon by forests pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. I think that is, you know, there's little apples and oranges there. And so here's, here's why some of these projects are, are a challenge and why when we think about forest carbon, I think we need to be a little bit more honest with ourselves. This is from a college in New England. I'm not gonna say which college it is, but um, this is a carbon credit project. And this, at the start of the project, you see the stocks of total CO2 in this forest land that was owned by this, by this university or college. Um, and you see the red line is the carbon uh, sequestered through the project projected. And the blue line is what the baseline would be. So what the comparable would be. And the way this worked is when the forest is inventoried, the modeling said, well, what would this college do if they managed only on financial returns? And if you have a mature forest that's been managed to be a mature forest, and then you say, we're going to transition the management to just maximizing financial returns. Well, financially, your best bet is to cut a majority of your, any of your mature growing stock in the first few years. And so that's what you see with this blue line is half of the growing stock was cut in the first 10 years based on this model, because that's what you would do if you wanted to maximize your financial revenue. If that were your only multiple, or your only use, right? It was just financial revenue. That's what you would do. And the red line is saying, well, what if carbon's your, your only use? So you try to maximize that carbon. And that's, and that's that projected increase in carbon stocks. The carbon payments are between that red line and the blue line. The problem is the university, the college was probably going to continue to do what's on this black dotted line, which was keep their forest in a mature state. And so the payments between the dotted line and the blue line or the dotted, sorry, the dotted line and the green line, which is the average of the blue line, is payments for carbon that have already been sequestered. So some company bought carbon credits, emitted a certain amount of fossil fuels based on those carbon credits for carbon that was already stored in a forest from decades prior. And that's one, I think that's, that gets to the nature of this, this problem of misunderstanding and misusing carbon sequestration storage in forests as one of the, one of the objectives. Um, and then I'll also point out that we, we need to be careful that we don't just assume that carbon will carbon storage will perpetually increase in our forests. If we do that, we ignore disturbance. And disturbance is something that has never not happened in forests. Forests continually get disturbed. If they just don't continually get disturbed in the lifetime of humans, at least in our region. So we don't necessarily see it all the time. Right? I'm not sure anybody on this call uh, can remember or was alive during the 1938 hurricane. Um, but that next round of disturbance could very well be in the near future. So I think we need to ask ourselves like this carbon saturation point and when do we, how do we, if we're gonna try to stay in that maximum carbon state, what might we do to be able to, to have that happen? Um, and and I, I point all this out because I think foresters, really need to start championing some, championing some of these efforts. Right? So how do we improve forest management as it relates to carbon? This is a big question. What can we do to have carbon as an objective in our forest management and do positive things for it? And there are things we can do. So you'll see this, I mean, this WI paper says improve forest management. Well, what does that mean? There's a lot of folks saying improve forest management. Well, what can we actually do? And that's what I'll get into right now. 
Um, and I guess maybe before I do that, when we're talking about forest management for, from the perspective of carbon, don't let this conversation be binary. The conversation is not do nothing or manage. That is a very binary conversation and it ignores all of the many things we can do through management that are not equal when it comes to forest carbon. Not all forest management options have the same carbon implications. And also no management doesn't always equal long-term carbon stability. It can very much equal long-term carbon risk. And so we need to be thoughtful about how we have this conversation and not just have it be, oh, we should manage forests or we should not manage forests. Because if it gets down to that state, we already lost the um, potential to, to maximize what we could do. So um, I'll just uh, point out quickly, this is from some of our Yale forests. Um, our carbon stocks have increased through time in managed forests, in addition to producing wood products. And how do these things all add up and compare? There's a lot of research that is, that's being done now and still needs to be done before we get uh, some conclusive discuss, uh, decisions on this. And, and we can discuss some of this in more detail, but I don't wanna get into all the nuance of everything. What I'd like to do is talk about different management opportunities and how we can use those to, to maximize forest carbon. Um, this, this is a study that came out of um, uh, Northern New England and, or the Northern Forest Service region. And, um, and I think it's, it's a nice example of how management can actually have really positive carbon benefits if it's a certain type of management. The chart in the, on the center right here is looking at above ground woody carbon stocks and predicted carbon loss in unmanaged versus managed forests. And what they found was that in their managed forests, they had less predicted carbon loss because their trees were healthier. And in this case, the managed forests particularly were uneven age management. So a specific type of, un of management, uneven age management, not um, even age systems. So uneven age management, had much lower predicted carbon losses than unmanaged forests because the trees in that uneven age management were um, healthier and, a bit, and better able to withstand disturbances and continue to grow when unmanaged trees tended to lead to uh, potentially more risk as these stands were aging. So just an example of like type of management matters. Another one, this is from uh, the Pacific Northwest, but. The, the conclusion here is that big trees hold more carbon. And I, I put in there, believe it or not, right? So within the forest, our bigger trees proportionally hold more carbon. And so one of the things we can do as we think about managing forests and maintaining forests is growing big trees. And one way to grow big trees is to give trees space to grow and then maintain those on the landscape. And so having some big tree retention can be a really positive carbon management tool. Um, but we have to think about this in, in, the, in the concept of, of time. And we can't think about our forests as just continually reaching this climax stage and continuing in that climax stage. Because if we do that, we ignore change. Um, and our forests are perpetually changing. And with climate change, they're changing even more unpredictably. So we're more likely to have this individualistic concept moving into the future, where our future forests are not gonna look like our previous forests unless we do something to actively make, make that happen. And that, that relates to climate change stresses on our forest, and it also relates to land use history and invasive species dynamics. Um, and all of these, these past changes, and, and they, they are gonna make our future forests different than what they are today. And if we want our future forests to be positive for carbon, we probably need to be actively making that happen in many of them. Um, so how do we maintain productive function, maintain growth? Um, a lot of things we can do, right? So we can maintain multiple age classes. We can ensure native species have opportunities. We can ensure soil integrity. I mean, this is one of the most important things. Maintaining our soil integrity gives us the ability to grow trees. Um, species diversity gives us a diversified portfolio. Meaning if we have an invasive species come through and knock something out, we don't lose it on the whole landscape. So we wanna have this productive functioning forest but we need to maintain um, this ability to adapt and change. And that, that can mean different ages and species and structures on the landscape. So this is just a, a sort of sketch up I did on some things we could do in forest management to 
encourage long-term carbon stability and encourage short-term carbon benefits. And I, I broke this down into sequestration versus storage. So um, just, some, just some thoughts there on things we could do, like create structural complexity, maintain stand growth rates, maintain soil integrity, ensure that regeneration is occurring, um, even if it's periodic, um, keep stands vigorous in growth. This is a document, uh, forest management carbon sequestration, and I, and I pulled part of this table out, which is an example of uh, the Green Mountain Audubon Center's management plan around tactics that they can use and then approaches to, to have carbon as a man management objective. For example, inactively manage the tactic, inactively manage stands, increase stocking levels by allowing trees to get to larger size classes. What are the approaches for that? Increase stocking on well-stocked or understocked forest lands. There's other benefits to it. Um, Promoting red oak, the bottom one here, promote northern red oak component in areas where the species is present because red oak is long lived and stores and can get large and can store a lot of carbon. Um, and how do you reach that? Have species and structural diversity. So there are a lot of things we can use to achieve multiple, multiple use forestry. We can we can zone out where we have uses, meaning this forest is for carbon, this one's for recreation, this one's for wildlife habitat, this one's for timber. Um, we can combine those uses um, or we can shift uses, right? We could say this is for timber now, then later on it's for wildlife. Um, I think with carbon, I think it can work really well with combining the uses, especially since the forest products come into one of the benefits related to carbon. But this is, the, this is some of the conversation I'll leave. Um, I'm just gonna leave it open on the end of this PowerPoint here is how should we approach forest carbon objectives within the context of multiple use? And so from there, I'm gonna stop sharing. I'll turn it over to Jeff and uh, yeah, I'll stay on the call and looking forward to listening to Jeff chat. Joe, that's great, thank you. And there are some questions that were coming in. We'll probably just hold those till the end. And Jeff, if you wanna share your screen, we'll... Okay, let me bring it up. You can hear me now, right? Yes, thank you. Oh, wait a second. Let me. All right. Why does this not want to come up? Oh, dang, it all. Share screen. Screen two. So you're going to see that. And I was doing what you're not supposed to, which I was going to the very beginning. There it is. So you see the full screen now, right? Full screen, influence of management on forest carbon. Excellent. Thanks, Pete. And thanks, Joe, for a, a great talk. First off, I just want to thank uh, our collaborators on this, especially Regional Water Authority, the Nature Conservancy, and White Memorial Foundation for allowing us to uh, conduct this research for the past almost 40 years now. And also uh, the other collaborators, the Forest Service, uh, the Forest Stewards Guild, and the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative uh, who have uh, provided some of the financial support. So as we all know, uh, the climate has been changing and the climate is changing. And uh, the predictions are we're probably gonna get hotter and we're probably gonna get a little bit wetter around here. And most of you, I just wanna go through this again because I'm gonna be talking about above ground biomass. That's what we looked at and above ground carbon. And that accounts for about 48% of the carbon uh, that's out there. The other uh, components of carbon, like Joe talked about, forested harvest products, it's one we couldn't look at directly, but litter and deadwood, um, they're relatively stable and soil uh, carbon and below ground biomass are also relatively stable um, when you go through the literature, uh, depend, even with different harvesting methods. The one thing uh, that has been, and this is, I just want to bring this up because it's going to come in later on in the talk, is that it looks like that more forest management, when you have, when they develop more complex forests, can actually uh, sequester more carbon every year than simple monoculture or completely even aged forest. The other thing to recognize, and I think most of us have read this and know that unmanaged forests generally have more uh, stored carbon. And I think one of the interesting things from what I'm gonna talk about here is that carbon storage in managed forest usually recovers, they say 40 to 100 years. It looks like from where we've been looking at here in Connecticut, it's closer to 40 to 50 years, we actually have recovery 
of carbon on the site, which doesn't include any carbon, which is stored in long-term durable wood products. So just so we all have the, uh, the same terminology, you, you probably already know this, but uh, Pete and I are both aficionados of bourbon. Uh, sequestration is new carbon being added to storage. And storage is the amount of carbon which is being stored. And then harvesting reduces the amount that's stored out in the woods, but it's usually put into a durable wood product, just a plug for a local distillery. Makes pretty good bourbon. I want to give a, a big thanks to uh, the guy who was here before me, Dr. George Stevens. He established these plots back in the early 1980s. Uh, they originally established to look at uh, the impact of different cutting practices on uh, forest regeneration. But George set this up so well that we were actually able to look at changes in above ground carbon uh, over the past uh, almost 40 years now. And these plots have been through three cutting cycles. So this is a, a pretty unique uh, study in that way. And these aren't small plots. They're uh, five to seven acres in size. And we had uh, six different treatments out there. We had an uncut control. Uh, to make it simple, a 16 inch diameter limit. We had a shelter wood, uh, which then had a uh, overstory removal back around 2000, 20 years after the initial shelter wood. We have multi-age crop tree management. I don't have a lot of time to get into that, but think of that as a way of producing five age classes and maintaining five age classes, including one of the age class, which is enlarged trees. So this is a way of actually developing very complex structures and having a steady product flow. And the idea is that every 20 years you come through and you cut the uh, largest 20% of the trees. Uh, you pick uh, some new trees, which in a hundred years will grow into large trees and you cut everybody, uh, which is four inches in diameter and greater, which is not a crop tree. We had a silvicultural uh, clear cut, which was a true silvicultural clear cut. It was a harvest and everything two inches and greater uh, was supposed to be cut. They probably ended up cutting everything uh, half an inch in diameter and greater. And then we had a 12 inch uh, diameter high grade. Uh, so those were our six treatments, just a different way of looking at them. Again, we had a forest preserve, that multi-age crop tree with five different age classes, each one uh, created every 20 years, a diameter limit cut, a shelter wood, uh, which had original, uh, prep cut and then had the entire top removed. We had a high grade or commercial clear cut if you want and a silvicultural clear cut. And we took a lot of measurements and harvested the trees and then came back and looked at. The one thing which is pretty exciting is we're now working with NRCS who's looking at the change, the impact of uh, these different harvest methods on soil carbon and actually on uh, movement of nutrients and, uh, and bulk density and everything else by the different harvest methods. Hopefully within uh, a couple of years, we'll have those results. Uh, they would have been done sooner, uh, but with COVID, they had some real restrictions. I will say in this talk, it is gonna be a bit of a technical talk. Um, if you're not familiar with some of the uh, uh, terms, uh, please feel free to email me and you can also email me and I'll be more than happy to share this presentation so you can sit back and just look. Basal area is the traditional way that as foresters that we look at uh, how occupied a forest is. And what's interesting is don't look at the, the absolute numbers, but the important thing is, is look how fast these stands recover after all the different harvest methods. It's very, very quick recovery. And what's the one, you, you, two of them to look at, one is the top black line with the, the circles. And that's on the areas that were unmanaged. And we're actually have seen a plateau on those. And I'll get more into that later on why we're seeing the plateau. It comes with what Joe was talking about with the disturbance. But also look at the silvicultural clear cut. That's the light blue diamonds where it's completely clear cut. There was no basal area on there back after the clear cut. But now 40 years later, we're back to the original amount of basal area on those. So complete recovery within 40 years on basal area. Just for the foresters out there, I, I thought it'd be kind of interesting to 
talk just uh, one quick slide on saw timber value if you have a stand because economics you know are part of what it what we're interested in in forestry because it does cost money to manage the land and people need a, an income stream and if you look at uh the initial value of the stands that's the yellow bars those are all at 100 percent and then we look at what was the uh, value of the product that was taken off there and what's the value of the uh, standing timber, which is still out there. And every one of the, the different treatments and surprisingly, um, one reason we hadn't published, I'm just finishing up the paper right now before, is high grading and diameter limit cut, economically speaking, makes sense. And I, I think most of us know that we just don't like to talk about it. But the surprise is when you look at multi-age crop tree management, when you're having five different age classes and you have a steady uh, stream of product, that actually had the, uh, the highest uh, value after 40 years of any of the plots. So it's a, a really novel way of managing forests and it's also very aesthetically pleasing. But our focus here is gonna be on fo forest carbon. And if you look at this graph, and again, you don't have to study, I'm gonna show you a graph a little bit easier to understand later. You almost see the same pattern that you saw at basal area, didn't you? You saw that no matter what happened uh, with the harvesting type, you can see that there's very fast uh, recovery of uh, carbon um, over you know, 20 to 40 year period. But what I think is a little bit more interesting and I'm going to explain this one a little bit more, is let's look at, look at it as a bar graph, because I think it's a little bit easier to understand. And if you look at the bottom of each one of these, we have pre-1 and post-1, so that's before and after the, the first uh, harvest cycle. Pre-2 and post-2, that's before and after the second harvest cycle. And pre-3 and post-3, which is before and after the third cutting cycle. And if you look at Uncut, we had an increase in carbon over time. So the uh, the y-axis on all of these are carbon relative to what the initial amount of carbon was out there. We saw an increase for the first 20 years, but since then we've really seen a plateau of carbon on these unmanaged sites. On the silvicultural clear-cut sites, what's interesting is that we've seen a recovery of carbon on these sites. There was some carbon even after the first cutting cycle because there were some small trees. But by 40 years after the, uh, the harvest, we're now up to about 85% of the initial carbon on the site. And this doesn't even include the forest products uh, which were put on there. This is just live above ground carbon. On the shoulder wood, we could see after the, uh, the first uh, harvest, we saw it was starting to recover. It was growing pretty quick. You know, we cut it down to 50% of the initial carbon. It was back up to almost uh, 80%. Of, it was over 75%. And after the shelter wood, again, there's a little bit of residual carbon in the smaller trees. And we again, we've seen a recovery. And if you look at the uh, the post threes on the shelter wood, you, you know, by the this most recent measurement that was made uh, last year. It's pretty similar to what happened after a silvicultural clear cut. So we're seeing very rapid accumulation on these sites. Again, I would predict in uh, 40, 50 years, we're gonna see these sites had as much carbon on them as when they were uh, initially looked at 40 years ago. When you look at the high grade site, and I, I shouldn't mention on here, with the initial high grade with a 12 inch diameter limit cut, there was not enough volume on there to have a commercial harvest. And all of these stands were part of commercial harvest. So we didn't have a, a harvest on those. And by the time we came around to the third cutting cycle, they had almost as much carbon on these high graded stands 40 years later as the uh, unmanaged stands did. But these high grade stands, again, we haven't uh, factored in the amount that was stored in forest products. After the last harvest, uh, we've seen a, a big decrease in carbon. And I got to tell you, these stands, uh, I don't think it's, we're going to be able to have another commercial harvest in 20 years. It's probably going to be at least 40 years before another commercial harvest is possible. What's interesting on the diameter limit cut, we saw that after the first harvest, we saw a recovery up to uh, close to 90% of the carbon, very rapid accumulation of above ground carbon on these sites. 
it was cut again and we've seen a recovery again. But now after the third cutting cycle, again, you know, there's a fair amount of carbon. There's still 50% of the carbon that was originally out there. But the uh, species composition and uh, the size class of the trees is probably going to be another 40 years before we can have a commercial harvest. And what's, what's really interesting is George put up this multi-age crop tree management, originally called a coppice with standards. He was trying to think of something out of the park. It's originally comes back from the, uh, the old English uh, way of managing forests where the lords owned the saw timber trees and the peasants could cut all the small trees. So that was the, uh, the way he was originally thinking of it. But what's kind of neat on this is every 20 years, there's enough volume out there for a commercial forest uh, harvest and we maintain large trees on the site. And we can see that we've got a uh, pretty good recovery of carbon with those uh, management. The one of the nice things about the multi-age crop tree management is you really do have a complex forest structure out there. We've got uh, large trees. Uh, some of them, even after the harvest, are still 16 to 18 inches in diameter. And we have small trees. And because all the pole trees, which aren't uh, picked to be future crop trees are still left out there. There's the uh, potential to uh, actually uh, manipulate the stand. So we're able to maintain oak on these sites uh, because here in, uh, in Connecticut, we can uh, grow pine. We're able to have some pine coming up on the sites. Heck, we've even picked uh, some shad bush and eastern red cedar just to remain, maintain a little bit of ecosystem complexity on the site. So that was above ground storage. Now, what about sequestration? Well, for the first 20 years, it was fairly consistent across all cutting treatments. All of them did roughly one and a half uh, to two uh, tons of carbon per hectare per year, which is fairly consistent with what's in the literature. What's really interesting, if you look at the, uh, the blue bars, the right bars for each one of the cutting treatments, on the uncut ones, we saw there's a dramatic drop off to the amount of carbon that was sequestered on these sites in the last 20 years. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But it's, it's really amazing, just like, uh, you know, we're uh, taught the basal area uh, growth is pretty consistent everywhere from uh, you know, the B line of full stocking up to full stocking. We're seeing the same thing even across multiple different uh, cutting practices. Now, I should say one reason why the high grade and the diameter limit cuts were put in there is because George wanted to include practices which aren't silviculture, but they are often practiced on private lands. Uh, you know, when somebody needs a, a new pickup, they have a medical expense, a kid go on to college, and they just need to maximize the economic yield on the plot. So why did we see this, uh, this maintenance of high carbon uh, sequestration on the plots? Well, one of the neat things about this study is individual trees were measured. And if we look at the uh, sequestration growth on an individual tree, if we look at annual sequestration and how many kilograms of carbon per tree per year, we can see that the, all of the, uh, the plots that were managed had fairly high carbon sequestration rates, uh, you know, 11 to 12 uh, kilograms per tree per year, except for the diameter limit. And that was because the largest trees were removed in as Joe had mentioned, if you read the literature, large trees continue to, seek, to be able to uh, sequester a, a lot of carbon. And they, they have plenty of room to grow after management. What's interesting is that on the unmanaged plots of trees, because they're more crowded, uh, you know, these are over are fully stocked, diverging on overstock stands. The individual trees weren't able to uh, sequester as much carbon per tree. What was really interesting in the uh, second cutting cycle, we actually saw higher uh, carbon sequestration rates uh, per tree um, because the trees were opened up a little bit more by the, uh, the second cutting, except if you look at the, uh, the middle one of these bars where it says a B under the second cutting cycle, that was the high grade. And recall that we didn't have a, a, 
we didn't harvest any trees on those during the second cutting cycle because there wasn't is, uh, a high enough commercial value on these stands. So what we saw was that these stands now are becoming fully stocked and uh, the trees are starting to slow their amount of uh, diameter growth. So I did a little bit of tease. So why are we seeing the increase in carbon sequestration on the unmanaged stands? Well, as Joe had mentioned, uh, there is going to be disturbance. Disturbance is part of the landscape. On one of the stands, uh, the one in Morris, uh, carbon sequestration, that's the, the top blue line with the triangles. Uh, carbon sequestration was, was going gangbusters. Up until 2018, when uh, this stand happened to be hit by a derecho, which is part of a system that brought uh, tornadoes apart across uh, large parts of the state. And what's interesting there is that uh, the damage really uh, was much higher in the unmanaged stand where you've got larger, older trees, which have been uh, relying on their neighbors to give some wind protection. And once one tree went down, you would see a number of trees in that whole area knocked down. And the larger trees, when they went down, were also knocking down some of the small pole-sized trees. The North Madison plot is kind of interesting because it had never been growing very well. Uh, not quite sure why, but it never had been. That's uh, the lower one with the, uh, the green squares. But it got hit by LDD. Uh, that's one of the new names for gypsy moth now. Gypsy moth has had its name change. So it had three years in a row of uh, pretty much complete defoliation between 2015, 16, and 17. And we've seen a, a pretty dramatic decrease in carbon on that site. So for some further information, I mean, there's a lot of great resources out there. If you haven't seen uh, Paul Catanzaro's and Tony D'Amato's uh, Forest Carbon book, that's a great read. It's a great one to share uh, with other people in your office. It's a great one to share with landowners. It's a great book to share with uh, the general public. And Connecticut, as in some other states, uh, there was a call by folks to uh, end all forest harvesting. And the uh, Yankee Division of Society of American Foresters got together and we put together a, a brochure, which we'd be more than happy to share with you, talking about the fact that forests aren't just for carbon. You know, we've, for, geez, since uh, the 50s, you know, we've been managing forests for multiple purposes. Uh, you know, Congress mandated it back in the 60s. We're supposed to manage for products, for recreation, for water, for air quality. Uh, and carbon is, is another product, and it, it's an important one to manage for. But I don't think we want to lose sight that forests are managed for multiple uh, reasons and not just uh, for one uh, purpose. So the take-home message from all this is that unmanaged forests, we've seen minimal changes in uh, carbon storage and board foot volume growth over the past 40 years in economic value. And in managed forests, there's a rapid increase in carbon sequestration and recovery of carbon forest, uh, after, sorry, recovery of carbon storage uh, after it hasn't been a management. So if you have any questions, uh, be more than happy. Uh, I'll pause one second before I turn off screen share and uh, go ahead and contact me. And one of the joys of working in uh, New England forest is we occasionally run across bears. So uh, take care and thank you. Jeff and Joe, that was great. I think it was a perfect combination of presentations between the, the concepts and the theories and then the on the ground, uh, here's what happens uh, side of things. Um, and just several questions came in earlier in the presentation about whether or not these uh, presentation slides would be available uh, both presenters have said that that we can that I can post uh, PDFs. So I will have those posted to a blog site that we maintain. I'll send an email to everyone who registered for the webinars to give them a direct link to that. So you can look forward to that in the near future. Hey, can I answer a couple of the questions really quick? That somebody I saw some there. Um, so, so how do you guys want to, how do Joe and Jeff want to manage the questions? We can scroll back to the top and work down or 
Jeff. Yeah, either way. You know, the only one I saw at the top was about concrete and whether the products factored into concrete. So I can just quickly say there's a lot of different ways that people factor transport and everything into some of those numbers of wood compared to non-renewable products. And uh, it, it, it really depends. But yeah, usually that transportation is factored in, but you got to look at each independent study. So, so from there, I think I, I could let Jeff hit a couple of the burning questions. Yeah, because mine are real quick answers. One okay. was sequestration of carbon or CO2 equivalents. It was just carbon. So you figure out biomass, and I actually did the species-specific conversion to carbon, so it wasn't CO2 equivalents. Um, fungal decomposition, I can't talk about it, but I'll let uh, Joe, he might know more about it, but we're able to access a dead wood carbon pool. We are doing that now, but unfortunately, when George did it, like I say, carbon was not even in anybody's horizon uh, back in the 80s. So they didn't collect any data on it back then. And George and I worked together on this back in uh, 2000. And again, carbon really was, it was sort of something you knew about, but no one was really looking at it. So we did not uh, look at carbon on the ground. I'll jump in on the fungal question because I mean it is a good and it, and it gets into a complexity of soil carbon, which is really difficult and not well conclusively studied. Um, so a lot of what we're talking about with carbon in forests is above ground carbon in trees. And so it's it's not getting into what's happening with the soils and all the rest. There are studies out there that have taken into account total respiration in the ecosystem. And, and that would account for some of this carbon being released from fungi. But, um, but yeah, this is one of the big questions. I mean, I have colleagues here at Yale who are studying methane release from trees. And there's a whole world in, in there we don't know enough about, such as how much methane is coming out of our standing trees and how does that relate to decay? Um, so yeah, there, there's quite a bit there. Um, mostly what we're dealing with in forestry is what we are able to quantify and that's related to uh, tree measurements, which are typically above ground. There, there was a comment I heard from someone uh, yesterday uh, was talking about, uh, you know, one of the things you can do in forest management to increase uh, carbon sequestration is go out there and cut all the uggs, the unacceptable growing stock, the ones which especially uh, have any rot or decay or cavities, because they're pretty much decaying as fast as they're actually growing. And so they're taking up a lot of space, but they're really not adding anything to carbon sequestration or storage on the site. I want to take another quick question here. One was, does managed forest carbon recover after 40 years and then stay equal to unmanaged as long as management continues? Or does it drop and recover after each disturbance and harvest? So forest, so Managed forest carbon, like carbon in managed forest will always drop after each harvest because you're removing some. And if you're not accounting for carbon stored in forest products, that carbon would be lost from the forest. And so I think you have to figure products in with many of these questions when you're doing, you know, fair calculations. But I also, um, I also want to note that and this isn't a critique of Jeff's work. This is a critique of Jeff deciding to retire when we should keep him on for longer. But this is a 40 year time frame. And so the forests that are being studied at the Connecticut Ag Station and through the work Jeff's proposing and so much other forest carbon work is looking at a snapshot of a much longer stand age and rotation. And so you're looking at forests that are, and Jeff, correct me, but probably in stem exclusion or understory reinitiation when we're thinking about these unmanaged forests, eventually there will likely be either this gradual decline of carbon storage and sequestration or this fast rapid loss due to landscape level disturbance, which didn't show up in the 40 years that uh, of the study you've seen. So I, I wanna point out the time frame we think about this is really important. That's a fair point, John. These stands were about 70 years old when the study was started. Uh, now they're about 110 years old. So that's a very fair, fair point. Although we did find some trees because uh, Southern New England, like much of the East, uh, had repeated cutting uh, near some of the uh, 
the, the wetter areas, uh, we actually found some trees going back to 1700s. Jeff, there's a question about species composition between the different treatments and if that could have factored into what you saw as differences in growth over time. So for example, was there a lot of hemlock in one treatment that may have been impacted by hemlock woolly adult genome? On our plots, there weren't. Uh, George is very good about picking uh, areas which had uh, pretty consistent uh, composition. They were primarily red oak with some black and chestnut oak mixed in. Little, very little uh, white oak. Primarily uh, red maple on one of the sites, uh, sugar maple on the other sites, they're a little bit higher in base. And like a lot of Southern New England, uh, birch is very common. Uh, in fact, it's a predominant species after a harvest. And that's black birch for those of us in Southern New England and sweet birch for those of you in uh, Pennsylvania. Peter, I'd say there's a question on there. Is it seems that one take home from this research is that forest management results in greater carbon sequestration. Is that correct? Um, I, Jeff, I want you to jump in after, but I think it does if we factor in forest products. Um, it's, it, it can reduce carbon storage in the short term if we don't factor in forest products and it can increase carbon sequestration at the tree level but the stand and then the landscape level get a lot more complex as we factor in disturbance and time. No, and that's a great point, John. I didn't want to get way into the weeds here, but the uh, stands, especially the, the clear cut stand after the shelterwood top was removed, uh, they, were, they had higher stand level sequestration rates than the other stands, but it looks, uh, well, the numbers show that they're actually starting to slow down and they're approaching those of the unmanaged stands. So early stands for the first, you know, five, 10 years, it's not a lot of carbon uh, is being sequestered, but then sequestration rates uh, just look like they go through the roof and then they gradually slow down. And that's consistent with the literature when you read, read it. John, I don't think you're able to talk. So if you want to type your question in, I saw someone who's raised his hand there. Uh, Jeff, I'm gonna point out, there, there's a, uh, in the chat, there's a comment about decaying trees are habitats for wildlife essential to our world as well. And, and absolutely, like there are reasons for some trees to get old and die that have a lot of values. And I think that's why when we're thinking about carbon and forest management, we also need to be thinking about um, opportunities to, to go against that, that carbon and maybe leave the trees to die and decay in the forest so they provide other benefits, right? This is that multiple use and what are we trying to achieve question. So yeah, absolutely. No, that's a great point. So Joe, there's a question about, I think it was Joe's presentation, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe it was Jeff about soil integrity. Can yeah. You... Yeah, so the, the point about soil integrity is, you know, maintaining your soil so it can, so it can support tree growth and roots. And, and ideally the, the better we care for our soil, you could, you could argue the better our trees are gonna grow. And so if we are going to manage a forest, we need to be very careful that we're not losing soil through erosion or causing excessive compaction, or if we have residual trees that we're leaving, causing all sorts of damage to their roots, which would impair their growth into the future. And um, you, know, you can have very different results in terms of tree growth if you are careful protecting roots and soil, or if you are destructive in the process of uh, removing trees or, or managing the forest in other ways, not move, removing trees. We can think about this with recreation impacts, especially heavy intensive trails in area where you might get soil damage and root damage to trees. So, so the point is, you know, the soil is that medium for, for growth and health and resilient forests. And if we damage it and lose it, we, uh, we lose a lot of productivity be it whether we do that in management or in other ways we use our forests. Okay, Joe, there's another question for you. Um, the one o'clock timestamp says, um, maybe I'm not understanding the question, but it's talking about kind of the cost analysis of using uh, wood in home construction, residential construction versus alternatives. 
uh, both the cost of materials as well as the cost for uh, labor and cost for uh, production and shipping. So do, do you, are you familiar? Yeah. With, I mean, that, that's getting a little bit outside the forestry sphere, but I don't know if you have any. Yeah. I mean, I, I can speak to that. Though. I mean, I built my own home, right? So I'm, I'm I, and I tried to maximize wood. I, I think the cost of these materials, it, you know, it can depend on what you're getting and where you're getting it from. Um, and where you are lo locally, you know, if I were in uh, northern Maine, I could access white cedar at a different price than I can here in Connecticut. Um, if I wanted to you'd do like cedar shakes or something. But um, I think what you want to ask is, is what materials are going to like, where can you maximize the use of wood that is also going to be practical and fit within building codes and fit within um, fit within your um, you know, your use. And so if you're thinking about flooring, well, if you have uh, ceramic tiles versus hardwood floors, you, you know, the hardwood floor is going to be more carbon friendly. Um, or if you have vinyl flooring versus, um, you know, some type of wood flooring or, or your trim, is it going to be plastic? You know, just even, even the construction of your home, right? Is it going to be steel uh, studs or are you going to be able to use wood studs? And the price differences between all these different choices um, can vary. And so I think you want to be talking with your contractor about that as an objective and then thinking about where you can work wood in and where it makes sense. And then also think about types of wood. Like I, I, just a quick example, I built uh, the staircase for my home and I built it out of hickory, not just because hickory is a beautiful wood, but because hickory was the cheapest wood that I could buy as pre-made stair uh, treads. And so not only did I save money, but I got a really carbon dense wood that's very beautiful. Why was it less expensive? Because less people want hickory. Everybody wants maple or oak or something else. So, you know, the type of wood can make a difference if you're doing something like hardwood floors. Um, you might be able to have some savings just by finding the species that's outside of the norm. Very good response. Jeff, there's a question about uh, multi-age multi-age prescription. And if you can go into re just review kind of the, the cutting prescription and the observation is that it seems like based on the data that you prevented that there would be an opportunity for converting the more common even age stands to these multi-age. But how are we going to do that given at least what we see in New York as problems with regeneration? acquiring regeneration of desired yeah, species. Was, that's, that's a great point. And in a nutshell, you go out there and you pick, try to find, the first time you go out in the stand, you try to find 50 to 70 trees per acre in five different size classes, because you're not going to have five different age classes. That's what you'd like to, to work towards. So each size class has 50 to 75 trees? No, total. Okay. So it looks what it ends up after you you harvest it is it looks like uh, a park because you cut everything except for those 50 trees. And so you've got trees across a wide range of uh, you know size classes. And you make certain that you leave, you know, at least 10 to 15 trees per acre in your largest size class, because those are going to be trees 20 years down the road that's going to be the trees that you're going to harvest. And, you know, when you look at the numbers, roughly 30 trees per acre account for about 75% of the economic value of a stand. So you're going to be harvesting, you know, about 30, 40% of the economic value if you just harvest those largest, you know, 10, 15 trees per acre. But then you're, when you do that, you're going to be also releasing, uh, their neighbors, you're going to be releasing some of the ones which now have grown into the pole size class. So you can carry those forward. So the trees are really, when you do it that way, they're open grown. I can give a more technical description. Anyone wants to email me or if someone's ever in the area, more than happy to take you out in the a field thing. I might be retiring, but I'm not going away. Uh, I just don't have to do any administrivia and I won't be voluntold to do anything anymore. So. Okay, there's also a question on how to measure the sequ rate of sequestration. Sure. Well, what we did is we said, uh, 
we just looked at uh, net sequestration. Uh, actually, in the paper, we looked at, well, I won't go into that. We looked at net sequestration. So we looked at how much carbon was on the site uh, you know, after the harvest and how much carbon was on the site uh, 20 years later. And that was our net sequestration. So you just calculate that on a per tree per year basis. Uh, no, we actually uh, went out there and uh, did it at the beginning and the end of each cycle. So that's on a per acre basis. Right, I mean, you, you have can, to you figure can, out. You can, but you can then divide that by the number of growing seasons and get the sequestration. Right, that's how we did it. Yeah, OK. Uh, either of you want to talk about the effects of earthworms on soils and carbon in soils? Hopefully you don't have them. <laughs> At least you don't have the jumping worms. Because Pete, I know you worked in that, but. I did not, no. Nope. Oh, I thought you did. Um, if you get into a stand which has the jumping worms out there, it's a really sad thing to, to watch the O and then the A horizon disappears. Uh, what's gonna be, I mean, the, the impact on carbon, I have to believe is gonna be staggering. Uh, What's going to be the impact on forest growth? I think it's going to be a problem because that can causes increased nitrification and then leaching of nitrogen out of the system. It, uh, the earthworm cast also make it so phosphorus is, is more mobile and can actually be washed off the site. So we're going to lead into nutrient problems. It's going to lead into problems that the sites are going to uh, become droughtier because they aren't going to have uh, a lot of that organic uh, which acts as a sponge. Uh, it's going to be a, you know, it holds water unless it percolates into the soil. It's going to be a problem because, um, you know, if you have a dry spell and if you don't have that organic layer, when you get the uh, rain, it's going to tend to wash off more and not soak in as much. So worms are bad, for sure. Regular worms are good in your garden, lousy in the woods. Right. Is there, for either of you, is there a relationship, kind of a simple rule of thumb relationship where if you say, well, here's a tree that's you know, for a given diameter, what would, how much carbon is in it? I mean, I, I think we could, all of us think about how to create that, but have you heard of that relationship? I, I don't know. I mean, usually those relationships are based on the merchant value. So you, you find like the board footage in it and then you convert that to total carbon. But um, there probably are some tools online for this. We tend not to use them in, in research. Right. Uh, you know, we tend to use algorithms and these, these uh, formulas that are st stocking tables essentially that are established. But I can dig around and look well around it, but I, I don't have anything on top of my head on, on that. I mean, you could go by weight, it, you know, the assumption that half of wood, like half of green wood is water, and then half of the weight of dry wood is carbon. There's like a general, that's a general assumption, not in, I wouldn't use it for research, but for your own measure, if you could figure out how much the tree weighs or like a piece of wood or a log, then you could, you could work some of those numbers, like take the water content out by 50% and then the carbon is about 50% of what's left. Or it's 25% of the green volume or green weight. Okay. It's not gonna be exact, but. Right. That's a good, good quick calculation. So there's, uh, we're coming back to the notion of securing uh, desirable regeneration and the impacts of deer and the ability of deer to favor invasive plant species. And so, I, Jeff, I'm thinking about if, if your study was started in 2022 rather than whenever it was 1972, would, would you have expected the same outcome, the same trajectory of those di stand diagrams that you shared? was really surprising because these were commercial harvest, uh, not only in our stands, but they were in two of the areas they're also harvesting adjacent to the stands. I was very surprised at how good the regeneration is if you're just looking at number of trees. 
If you're looking at uh, species composition, probably not so much because it's mostly uh, birch with a fair amount of beech. And now it's kind of scary what's going to happen with beech with beech leaf disease or potentially scary. So we're seeing a complete shift in species composition, but we're pretty much always able to grow birch unless the deer density gets up over you know, 40 deer per square mile. Okay. But are you regenerating oak? No, sir. Okay. The only place where we're, and this is a surprise if you start wandering into an area which has been harvested, and this is where the multi-age crop tree management works, you'll always find these pockets of an eighth to a quarter acre where who the heck knows why, but you get good regeneration. For us, it'd be oak. Pete, for you, it's probably a little more for sugar maple. But those are the areas when you come back in to do the next cutting cycle on the multi-age crop tree management, it's like, well, you know, maybe we'll focus a little more here and harvesting the saw timber here because we have, you know, large regeneration. And if you were to look at the stand average as a whole, it sucks. But you find these pockets and you can release these pockets as part of uh, when you have the harvest operation. I feel bad for Jose there who says they, they have a lot of Norway maple in the woods. Yeah. So either or both of you could talk about, uh, see, Bill points out kind of the land use history of, of uh, agriculture and overgrazing soil erosion and wanting to know if there's if it's advantageous to leave wood on the ground during harvesting rather than you know, these would obviously be the, the non-valuable stems, but is that a way to maybe try to replenish some of the soil organic matter? I mean, I think that depends on so many things. And, you know, he points out the aesthetics problem and the fire risk. There, there could be operational problems with that um, later on when you come back and that wood hasn't decayed and you have to get around it. Um, I mean, that, that wood you're leaving is going to eventually break down and be lost to the atmosphere in terms of carbon. And yeah, maybe some of the nutrients will, will cycle. But um, yeah, it, it, it so much depends on what you're trying to regenerate or if what's growing there. I'm not sure you're going to see a major fertilization effect from that wood. Um, I do think there would be some really positive, you know, if you were in a forest that had very little coarse woody material and large coarse woody material, they're, they're definitely would be positive benefits of having some of that coarse woody material uh, exist on the forest floor from a habitat perspective. But usually with tree growth, I mean, if we wanna do something actively to maintain, to, to increase tree growth, we give trees more light as opposed to like fertilization. I'm not, I'm not sure you're gonna get a lot of fertilization from that wood you leave on the ground. Especially the bigger the stem, the higher proportion of carbon to, to like external to other nutrients. It's the tops that have that higher um, ratio of like carbon to other nutrients. Okay. Um, here's a question about uh, kind of prioritizing trees that should be cut sooner than other trees. So, is there are the trees that you would prioritize for cutting over other trees because it's um, because differences in value, either economic value or ecologic value. Kind of a hard question, maybe out of context. But. I mean, I can give you a context. I mean, it, it is so much context-based, right? And we, at the Yale Forest, we have these conversations all summer with students on our apprenticeship. And, um, you know, how do we determine what's there? I mean, one is, is financial value. Does it have potential to grow into, into timber? Some is um ecological value we have a number of wolf trees so these these relic trees that that were in pasture land for the last 300 or 200 years you know we often leave those trees from an ecological they they tend to have a lot of wildlife benefit because they have holes and big crowns and they're just they're they're a structure that we don't have otherwise so we might leave them from that perspective but those trees could also be you know, releasing more methane. Like we're not, we're not sure about some of the carbon dynamics of some of those types of decisions. Um, but yeah, th there are a number of, of reasons to do that. I mean, I think we know what we shouldn't do and what we shouldn't do is just go cut all the financially viable trees 
and leave everything that's non-financially viable. That's that high grading. And we know that's bad, but in terms of what's good, there's a lot of decisions that can be good because there are a lot of things we wanna have our forest provide. Thank you. And I think maybe the last question, just clarification on measuring the rate of sequestration. Um, there are uh, charts or equations that are available on a species by species basis that convert the volume of wood to the amount of carbon in that unit of volume. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, there's some comp complex ones where you uh, measure the tree diameter, you measure the diameter, you know, you need, a, you need to measure the diameter right below the uh, top of the live crown, you measure the total tree height, then you get, those are used to get estimates of the biomass of the tree from formulas other people have developed, and then you do a conversion. Every species has a, a different specific uh, gravity and amount of carbon it has in it, density, so then you do a conversion. Um, you know, you really can't weigh every tree that you harvest, and you certainly couldn't uh, weigh the trees that are still alive, so. Right, and so if somebody wanted to find those equations or charts, how would they search for that? Email me and I'll send you the papers. Okay, here you go. Um, all right, now the last question. Does red oak sequester more carbon than sugar maple or white pine? I, mean, I think that depends, right, on the site. Yeah. Of how fat, It's all about growth rate. Red oaks can dominate the canopy and grow really quickly, um, which, which white pines can do that too, but white pines aren't as carbon dense. I don't know, Jeff, you might have a better gauge of the species differences, but I mean, I would be looking more about growth rates. Yeah, I think it's just a, a matter of growth rate. So for an individual tree, I think a red oak can grow more than a white pine, but white pine, look at the amount of biomass you can grow per acre in a white pine stand than you can grow in a red oak stand. Yeah. Thank yeah, it's you. good not to be in the it's good not to be in the realm always of thinking about individual trees when we think about forest carbon. Right. We can we can go down a lot of poor little sidetracks there that lead us to the wrong answer. It's like getting away from tree density. Very good point. All right, I want to thank uh, Joe and Jeff very much. Um, Jeff, can you type your email address into the chat window, please? Thank Joe and Jeff very much. The, uh, these are great presentations. I want to thank the 120 participants that have stuck around through the, the 30 minutes of questions, answers, and questions, and, and for all the very thoughtful questions. So I appreciate it all. And Jeff and Joe will be back this evening at 7 p.m. So if you want to see it again, see you in uh, about five and a half hours. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks for hanging around and for great questions. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I'm going to sign off, but yeah, thanks, everyone. See you in, uh, I'll see Pete and Jeff in a little bit. Yes. There you go. Take care. Thanks very much.